Well, hey guys, and welcome to another Ask Zach. So I uh, realize that I've been a little lax in actually answering questions, so I'm going to answer some questions today. So thanks for being patient with me. So I had a question about the uh, James Burton episode, specifically the Ooh Las Vegas lick. I met James Burton 15 years ago in a recording studio and was lucky enough to get to sit down with a guitar with him for a little bit while he was on a break. And he showed me uh, the way he played it. And, and I believe that's the way I remember it and that's the way I played it in the, uh, in the uh, James Burton episode. So here I'm just gonna show how to play it real quick. Um, you, it starts with a slide up. Uh, you're playing on the D string, you're sliding up to a B note on the D string, so you have and then you have the hammer-on lick, which is your first finger and second finger uh, on the G string, going in between a C sharp and a D. So you have this. So the pick is playing And the fingers are playing. And when you put them together, of course you should practice it slowly until you can play it right at a slow speed and then speed it up. You get. That's it. Uh, I think a, a big part of it is a uh, when I'm playing a James Burton thing, I try to kind of honor what he did, and I don't use like echo and things like that because he didn't, you know, on those recordings, it's just a Telecaster through an amp. You know, now there are those recordings where he used a wah-wah pedal or a phaser or a fuzz, but you can really tell. When he had his kind of clean tone, there was no echo there. I mean, he, you know, he didn't really get into using echo until, you know, much later. So even like the Emilu stuff, it's mainly a uh, his Telecaster through a Fender type amp or a Music Man amp, which is a Fendery type amp. So that's that. Uh, I had Tony in South Wales in the UK asked about the the descending lick at the end of U Las Vegas, which I have not been able to figure out. The closest thing I could get to it was just playing a banjo type lick in E and uh, playing something like this. Okay, that is uh, playing your pinky is on the G string on the 12th fret and then it's another hammer-on thing and you've got your uh, You've got this uh, G sharp note on your first finger on on the B string. Uh, and, and that is your third finger playing a B note on the D string. And that is your first finger playing a D note uh, on the G string. And then you're hammering on with your pinky onto that E note on the G string. And then you're playing the open B string. And then you move it down three frets and play that exact same thing. And then end with a... Of course, you need to play it faster than that to uh, to do that at the end of the song, and uh, I'm still working on doing that cleanly. Uh, another thing was the Ask Zach uh, theme song. So this came from uh, wanting to create an exercise to help with my hand pain that utilized all my fingers, and because I was really trying to get hand strength back 
and specifically trying to get pinky coordination back because I'd kind of lost it from not playing guitar very much and kind of babying this hand for a long period of time. Uh, so that's what that, you know, lick was all about. And it kind of started to sound like a song after a while. And it started, and if I kind of swung it, it sounded even more like a song. So I'm just going to play it real slow first. Uh, it's in the key of B flat. And you're basically playing the triad of, you know, the, of the B flat, E flat, and F. Uh, now over the, the F, you end up playing a, a, a seventh, a, you know, a dominant seven uh, chord, while the others are, are major seven. So you have... So you have a B flat triad, then you play the octave B flat on the D string, and, a, and then a descending, you know, major uh, major scale. And it, but after, at the fifth, you drop down to the third, and then you play the fourth. So you have drop down. So that's identical to the first one, just down a string. And then you have uh, the F lick. And then back to B flat with. Which is kind of a, a B flat major seven kind of arpeggio and then landing back on the on the B flat. Try that again. And I always try to, you know, swing it. You know, so that and uh yeah, it was about, you know, kind of using my pinky and not just being a, a boring exercise. I wanted it to sound musical. I, I don't like just playing exercises. Let's, let's, let's make music. So that's what that was about. And then it just seemed like it fit with, uh, you know, with what I was wanting to do with, with the show, which was about being fun and uh, maybe a little touch of old-timey nostalgia and some other elements in it. So... Next, I've had a lot of questions about how I set up my guitar and guitar tone. So I, this is where I have to make my big admission. I do not use any uh, measuring uh, tools in setting action. So I, uh, to check for relief, I press down on the first fret and the last fret, and I look at around somewhere in between the fifth and seventh fret and I make sure there's just a little touch of gap because I like the neck to be pretty straight um, you know but you know, of course if, if it was touching if there was no space there that'd be a problem then you'd need to loosen the truss rod and I actually had to loosen the truss rod on this because I had had tens on it and then I went down to back down to nine nine five through 44 strings and it was close enough and also probably because of the winter and changes in the weather that I had to, to back it off like an eighth uh, to a quarter of a turn on the truss rod. So I had to go, you know, uh, you know, counterclockwise. Uh, so yeah, so that's, you know, I checked that for relief as far as the nut. I like the nut to be, um, you know, I like the grooves to be pretty low. And the way I kind of check for this is I'll take a capo, and I'll, I'll play the guitar first, you know, open. And then I'll put a capo on the first fret. And it should play slightly easier, but it shouldn't play like a different guitar. If it plays like a different guitar, that means these slots are too high. And I'm not going to mess with this. Then I will go to Joe Glazer or some other, you know, qualified repairman and have him adjust that. And what I'll do is I'll take a capo with me, and I'll try to... I'll try to get a time when I can be there when we do the adjustment to make sure that it, uh, 
you know, make sure the, the nut slots are, are, are low enough because you can't have it where it's exactly the same with it open and with a capo on the first fret because the strings have to be able to pass over the first fret. So, and, and of course, when you put a capo on, it's mashed up against the first fret. So there's gonna be some difference. But it, again, it shouldn't play like a different guitar. So that's what I do as far as the nut. Uh, as far as the bridge and the saddles, uh, I set them as low as I can without rattling. And then I try to follow the radius of the fretboard. And uh, sometimes I just, you know, eyeball it. Sometimes I'll use some, uh, I guess I will use some little radius kind of gauge things that came with a, a Dan Erlewin book called uh, Make Your Electric Guitar Play Great, uh, which I highly recommend that book. Uh, it's a great book for uh, learning how to set up your guitar, and you should learn how to set up your guitar. Now, you know, I'm not saying you have to learn how to do fret work and nut work and all that stuff, because I don't do that. But I do set up my own guitars, and of course I, you know, get the intonation you know, in and, uh, you know, set my own pickup height. And uh, for pickups, I, uh, you know, I, I, first off with the neck pickup, I make sure when I press down at the last fret that there's some, di there's a gap in between there. And that becomes more important with actually the high E string because I slant my pickups to where the, 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 uh, the part that's underneath the wound strings is lower because these, these strings put out more signal so they need to be further away. You know, unless you've got some weird pickup that has different magnets under, on one side and not the other, you know, you need to have the side underneath the unwound strings needs to be higher. So not by a ton, but uh, so I'll press down at the last fret on the high E string and make sure that there's, you know, at least a bit of a gap because you don't, obviously you don't want it touching the pickup. Uh, the bridge pickup, I just make sure that it's uh, sitting below the top of the ashtray, uh, you know, the top of the, the bridge. And then, of course, again, I set the base end to be, you know, slightly lower. Again, action, I just kind of set it to where it plays cleanly for me. And, uh, and sometimes I'll change strings in action as I've been playing more. And as my hands get stronger, and if I'm playing a lot, well, then I will, you know, raise my action some, or I'll go up to tens, and I'll adjust the truss rod accordingly. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what I do, you know, for uh, for setting up guitars. Uh, as far as my guitar tone, I I like light guitars, which means I like them to be somewhere in between the upper sixes and eight pounds is about as heavy as I like to go on a Telecaster. I like lower output pickups, so I don't really like anything that's above 7.5 or, you know, I really like, you know, pickups in this 6K to 7K range. 8K is okay. That's kind of the top end as far as what I want from a Telecaster pickup because I want to get a good clean sound. That's kind of the biggest deal for me. Uh, as I've said, you know, a couple times, I wire the tone control where it only works on the bridge pickup because I... I found that I never want to darken the neck pickup, and that allows me to kind of set my amp for the neck pickup, and then I go to the bridge pickup, and then I just darken it some, and I have the sound that I want. Amp. Uh, on the amp, uh, I like Fender amps, specifically deluxe reverb amps. I don't care if it's a reissue or a 70s or an old one like this. This is a 1965 original. Uh, I have modified it with two major modifications. One, I have clipped the bright cap on it. This is very important to me. The bright uh, cap keeps it bright sounding with the volume under five. And a lot of times I do have, like right now, I don't have the volume on five. And if I didn't have it on five, it would sound thinner. So I've had that clipped and I have it clipped on every deluxe reverb that I have. Uh, you know, of course, bigger amps uh, than the Deluxe Reverb have a bright switch. And so you don't need to clip that. And I just leave the bright switch off on a Vibrolux or a Twin or a Super Reverb or an amp like that. The other big thing is the choice of speakers. So again, because I tend to play cleaner or with a light amount of drive, I need more mid-range from my speaker. 
And so that means I pretty much can't go with a lot of the traditional kind of blackface speakers. So I go with a Celestian Vintage 30. That is my favorite speaker for this amp. I've tried tons and tons and tons and tons of speakers and it's my favorite. Now you may like an, another one. Uh, I also like the Cream Alnico uh, by Celestian, but it still doesn't have enough mid-range. And so even though it's a $300 speaker and it's great, um, I still like the Vintage 30, you know, better, you know, because again, Vintage 30 is like a hundred bucks, uh, maybe a little more now. Uh, so yeah, the mid-range gives you the cut that you need, especially for playing cleaner. Now, if you've got a boost pedal on or an overdrive pedal on all the time, well, a lot of those have more mid-range to it and it kind of corrects that. But again, if you're gonna play clean, I recommend a more mid-range focused speaker. A G12H30, uh, you know, there's all sorts of you know, variations. So, but I recommend you check those out. So that's kind of my deal with tone. Uh, also, work on being able to get a good sound straight into the amp and use pedals just to enhance. I'm, you know, today I'm just using the amp and I have a smidge of compression and that's mainly just to keep things even. I'm not using a ton of compression. I'm not squashing or getting a bunch of sustain from a compressor and I don't have any other effects going. And so work on getting a good sound that way, you know, just straight into the amp and then get to where you can enhance it or give yourself other colors to paint with, you know, with, with echo or tremolo and or, or all of any other kind of effect that you want to use, but get a good core sound. All right. Well, I think that's probably enough for today. I really appreciate you watching. Please go down in the corner and subscribe. Uh, Let's uh, keep the channel going. I'm so grateful for all the growth that we've had. And uh, please keep sending your questions in. And I hope you have a great week. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.